Uh, thank you all for joining uh, to this uh, call information event on the sustainable software. Um, it's a new call for us, so I'm very interested to hear uh, what questions you have and uh, maybe what reactions. Um, and of course, hope you will all submit. Um, first, the agenda. Um, so um, we try to make this uh, um, a short, but still contain a lot of information. Uh, which also why it's uh, we put we'll put it on YouTube so you can actually uh, see the recording later if uh, if we're going too fast or if you missed something. Um, first, we'll introduce the eScience Center for those uh, of you that have actually never heard of the eScience Center but still managed to get into this uh, information event. Uh, then we'll explain the call for proposals, a bit about our expertise because if you're submitting to this call uh, and as you may know we provide uh, only in-kind support, then you want to know what kind of support we can uh, we can offer. Uh, something on software management plans, which are very important in this uh, in this call. Uh, then a break. Uh, then Surf uh, will actually explain their infrastructure. It's usually useful to use some of the Surf infrastructure in our projects. Uh, it's actually a question in the in the forum as well, so that's why uh, we're explaining this. And then we have this Q and A session where you can ask any question uh, you like. Um, first, to introduce the eScience Center, uh, our director of technology, Rob van Nieuwpoort. Uh, uh, we'll be explaining what the eScience Center is all about and why actually we have uh, calls to begin with and uh, this call in particular. All right, thanks Niels. A very warm welcome everyone to this uh, information event for this uh, yeah, new and exciting call, also exciting for us. Uh, the first time is always interesting and challenging. Um, I was looking through the uh, list of participants and it's uh, Really good to see uh, a couple of familiar names, but also a very uh, large number of uh, people I haven't uh, seen before. So that's, uh, that's great to see, very nice. Um, so especially of course for the, for the new faces, um, it's good to explain what the Science Center actually is and what it's all about. Um, so in short, we are the National Center of Expertise for Research Software. So we uh, develop um, research software in all sorts of different projects, in all sorts of different disciplines, basically all disciplines of research. Um, and we're an independent foundation. We started a bit more than 10 years ago. Um, we actually had our anniversary last year. Um, and we were founded by MAO and SURF. So for those of you who uh, don't know, uh, MAO is the, the National Research Council. They basically provide uh, the funding uh, for almost all research in the Netherlands. And SURF is providing the national infrastructure, the digital in infrastructure, so the supercomputers and, uh, and networks connecting universities and so on. And together they founded the eScience Center, like I said, a bit more than 10 years ago. And the majority of our organization consists of uh, research software engineers, like I said, yeah, we have the National Expertise Center for, uh, for Research Software. And then people actually building that research software, developing it, uh, designing it, uh, and programming it every day uh, are the research software engineers, and I'll say a bit more uh, about them in a minute, what they can do and what their background is, etc. And we developed a new strategy. Um, actually, we started doing that in 2021, and that's been running for several years now. And basically, there are two big ambitions in this strategy. And those two ambitions are reflected in the, uh, in the two paragraphs above here. So um, let me just read the text. A lot of uh, thought went into uh, the formulation of these, uh, these two paragraphs, so I might as well use them. Um, so the eScience Center is a research organization with the task to ensure that the Netherlands remains at the forefront of international research in applying research software to answer challenging and urgent research questions. So that's basically our first ambition. Um, and a couple of things uh, really spring out. So we are a research organization, research institute. We work at the forefront of international research. Um, so we basically typically don't really apply a commodity technology and we really like to, uh, to work on a state of the art, a state of the art of domain science or domain research. Um, and also state of the art in, in, yeah, in software technology, basically digital technology. So we apply and develop research software um, but always with the goal to answer you know, urgent, relevant research questions in the disciplines. 
And like I said, we work with all the disciplines. So from archaeology to astronomy and anything in between, and the life sciences, chemistry, um, basically all, all sciences, but also research and, and scholarly activities, basically. Um, so our first ambition is to basically enhance research with uh, research software. Now, we don't only work uh, with individuals uh, in, in, in individual projects. We also try to build a community around this. So we try to do capacity building. And that's basically the second, uh, second paragraph and also the second ambition that we have as a center. And it is, uh, and I can actually read this again, we fulfill this purpose by contributing to a robust national research community. And like I said, we really focus on communities and not individuals in which ultimately all investigators in all disciplines will be able to exploit advanced digital technologies. Um, so this is this capacity building I was talking about, right? We really want to work with, with communities and empower researchers in all disciplines, um, not only to use our software, but also to, uh, to start developing their own software and building on this whole ecosystem of research software that's out there. And we're in this together, basically. Uh, Niels, can you go to the next one? Um, so on the picture on the right, you actually see our two ambitions. So those are the, the two blue boxes. Uh, so one is uh, together with the research, develop research software in, uh, in challenging projects. So there we're really trying to, uh, to answer research questions and help uh, an individual or a group ahead in the project or actually also a community. And ambition two is more building of digital expertise. So empowering researchers in the landscape uh, yeah, with digital technology and expertise. And directly from those two ambitions basically follow a number of, uh, of calls. So we typically work with uh, calls for proposals. That's basically how we um, share our expertise, mostly at least. And connected to ambition one is the open e-science call. So that's really for domain research, answering research questions in research disciplines. Um, and we actually had an information event about that call last week. Um, so if you're a domain researcher and you're doing very innovative research, like, yeah, of course, everybody's doing that in the domain. Um, and if you need um, support and help with uh, digital technology, we can help you in the open e-science call. Um, but today we're talking about the call for sustainable software. Um, and that's basically about enhancing existing research software, making sure it's sustainable. So sustainability is becoming more and more a very important topic for the eScience Center. So sustainability in general, of course, but also software sustainability uh, particularly. And that's, of course, also related to this ambition too, eh? building this digital expertise, building capacity out there. And we're not trying to help a single researcher or even a single community. We really want to empower researchers in all disciplines. And there's a lot of very successful research software out there already. And in our experience, and we've been doing this for more than 10 years now, there's a lot of good software out there of very high quality. Um, it can still be professionalized further and maybe generalized further. So it can be reused in other projects, maybe potentially even in other disciplines. It should be sustained, right? It's not um, software that's built for a single project, but it could be used for a long time by many, a great number of researchers. And that's what this call is about. And then finally, we also have a fellowship program that also works via calls. Um, there we actually have an information event tomorrow. So if you're interested in becoming an eScience uh, fellow, basically join the eScience Center community, then you should tune in again uh, tomorrow, basically. Um, we also have more calls. We uh, very often have calls for small scale initiatives, for example. Um, so stay tuned, basically subscribe to our newsletter and we'll keep you in the loop. Also, you can look at, uh, on the website, of course. Uh, they're also published there. But if you subscribe to the newsletter, you basically automatically know what's going on in the, in the e-science landscape. Uh, next one, please. Yeah, so this is basically how we work, um, especially in Ambition One, where we work in these collaborative projects with the researchers. And I'll explain what the difference is with the current call, actually, the, that we're talking about today. So how do we work? We basically collaborate with researchers in projects, uh, really a project organization. And our projects have very different sizes. Eh? We have small-scale initiatives, like I mentioned before. 
those are in the order of a few months, maybe half a year. But our bigger projects can be maybe two or three or even four years in some exception. So multi-year projects sometimes. That's at least our bread and butter. And those projects are driven by research challenges uh, from the disciplines and faced by our project partners. And together, we're going to basically address those research challenges uh, yeah, by, by the use of software. Now, we don't offer any cash in our calls anymore. We used to do that in the past, but uh, since uh, a year or two, uh, we're not doing that anymore. We're only providing uh, in-kind expertise. So that's basically the expertise in the form of our research software engineers. And I'll explain in a minute what they, uh, who they are. And like I said in the beginning, we really apply state-of-the-art solutions from computer science and data science and, and artificial intelligence, and in general, digital infrastructure to answer those research questions in the, in the field. And it's really state-of-the-art. So we don't do uh, the application of commodity technology, and we really want to push the boundaries of what's happening in technology. Um, very important to us is that we do open science. Uh, we really uh, live and breathe open science every day in, in the publications that we do. We typically make them open access. Um, we try to make the data fair uh, whenever possible open, but certainly fair. And also the software we like to share with open, uh, open source licenses. So we really want to make sure everything is reusable by as many people as possible and basically open to use by anyone. Um, and that's, of course, also related to the next bullet, which is software sustainability, right? We want to make uh, progress and new technology and new software that's really sustainable beyond the lifetime of a project. That's also why it's open. But that's, not, of course, not the only thing you do, right? You can make it open, but you also have to make sure that it's actually, um, that there's uptake yeah, by the different communities. Because we cannot maintain uh, all the software that we build and develop together with our partners indefinitely. You basically need the help of the entire community to do this together. Yeah? And you also know what the demand is. You know what new features are needed. Uh, so you can uh, help us. Uh, uh, basically, together, we can develop those new features. Uh, next one again. So I already mentioned uh, a few times that we are employing research software engineers, or RSEs, for short. Um, and the name basically says it all. Huh? They're, they're research software engineers. So they work on research software. And they're researchers themselves. So most of them actually have a PhD. Uh, they're at least very interested in, in, in research in, in basically all disciplines. But they're also engineers. So they, they really know how to code. They're professional software engineers. Um, and we have a mix of about maybe 30, 70. So 70% uh, of the RSEs actually come from a research discipline with a um, broad orientation and a lot of affinity with uh, digital technology, with ICT and programming. So that's roughly 70%. And 30% of the RSEs comes, uh, come from computer science or data science or AI. So we have a really fundamental uh, engineer and computer science training. And they really love to apply it in, in different applications in different fields. And that, that mix is really uh, a very powerful mix, I think. Um, because they understand the research question that you might have. And you also understand modern ICT services. So they're really on the boundary of, of research and ICT. Um, yeah, next one, please. So what's the objective of this call? And uh, what better way of explaining this than to use an uh, XKCD? You, you might have seen this before, actually. So this is a very nice picture um, that really um, is close to my heart. So we, together, eh, all of us, we built this, this modern digital infrastructure containing both hardware infrastructure, but in our case, specifically software. And it's basically becoming ever bigger and ever more complex. And it's uh, it's not only research software, it's just also open source software and commercial software. It's a whole very complex tech or ecosystem software that's out there. And especially in research, what you see a lot is that the software is not maintained so well, or it might be very dependent on an individual, an individual PhD student or a postdoc who's somewhere in a basement uh, basically coding and, and developing and maintaining this software is on her own. Um, but that's not a very sustainable thing to do, right? If, if something happens to that person, yeah, uh, then what? Eh? You might run into uh, two big problems. And a lot of, of research and software projects actually depend on this. 
Um, so it's crucial that we make this much more sustainable than we have been doing so far. Uh, next one again, Niels. And that brings me to the objective of this call. Um, so this call for proposals supports not individuals, but communities of researchers, explicitly for communities, um, who require their software to meet higher quality standards. So it's about software quality and really improving uh, the quality and the applicability and the usefulness of the software and the, long, the longevity of the software, the sustainability of the software, to ensure the continuity and the advancements of the research in the longer term. So we really have a long-term vision uh, for this particular goal. Uh, so it's not just answering or addressing a single research question. It's really uh, improving the quality and the accessibility of the software for the longer term. Uh, now, how, how could we possibly do that? Of course, uh, we're in this together, so we're going to do it together with you. Is you want to make the software applicable to other disciplines or research problems, potentially, yeah, this software is generic enough. We want to improve accessibility, and sometimes that's very technical. Uh, it can have to deal with uh, user interfaces, uh, how easy is it to use and install and operate the software. Maybe actually turning the software into a, a service that hosts, that's hosted somewhere else. In the cloud, for example, uh, we want to enhance the technology readiness level of the software, basically raising the, the quality again to make sure it's correct. Eh? Your research depends on it. Um, in a way, the software, the research software is our instrumentation nowadays. Eh? Everybody is using software for their scientific uh, output. And we really want high quality science, and thus we need high quality software. Um, and also a very important aspect, so it's not only about technology, this call, it's also about community building. Yeah? So how do we form a community? How do we maintain it? How do we build it? How do we grow it? Uh, so lots of community building activities can be included, and we actually have a lot of experience with this as well. So we don't only employ research software engineers, we also have a number of community managers who basically do this on a daily basis. They and really build communities around research software. They think about the governance of, of software projects, for example. Uh, we build documentation and tutorials and trainings around software. And also, we also co-develop, eh, not only with individuals, but again with a whole community. So we organize hackathons, for example, to, uh, to jointly work on, on software projects. Um, yeah, next one, Niels. So why is this call so special? Yeah, so like I said in the beginning, and I think Niels also mentioned it, uh, this is the first time we do this call. And yeah, that's... Basically, we, because we came to the insight eh, in doing these science projects for the last decade, that there's so much demand and opportunity to make things sustainable, and that we could have a really big impact with sustainable software. Um, so what makes this call special? Well, it's fully in kind, like I said before. Eh, we supply the research software engineers and potentially also community management hours. Uh, so that's very different maybe to other calls that you might be used to, eh? different from what MBO normally does or what you get in Horizon Europe. We don't provide cash, we provide expertise. Um, and specifically for this call, there's basically no research question. So in the calls that we have, the Open eScience call, and the calls that we basically provide in uh, Ambition 1, those always center around a certain research question. But for this call, which is about software sustainability, we don't have a research question. But the starting point is basically existing software that you want to broaden in scope and make more sustainable. So it's really a different animal. Um, like I said before, there's a strong focus on community and workshops and making impact, eh? enlarging the impact of the existing software. That's, uh, that's really a key thing that you want to achieve uh, with this call. And finally, we really try to, uh, to lower the, the threshold for entry. Yeah? We really try to lower the barrier. So we really try to simplify the, uh, the application procedure. But that's also a bit of an experiment. So we basically try to make it as easy as possible to, uh, to acquire a grant like this. Um, yeah, to just reduce the amount of work that we have to do and uh, to keep everything lightweight. And I think with this, I give the word back to Niels or a little bit more detail uh, yeah, about the process uh, that we're going to use for this call. Yeah, thank you. Um, yes, so I'll, I'll be trying to explain uh, exactly how this call is going to go. As Rob mentioned, we try to make this as easy as possible 
but it still uh, needs to be fair, of course. So uh, um, some work will always be required. Um, so uh, first, uh, and I think foremost for some people who can apply for this call, uh, we have this concept of a lead applicant in all our calls. And uh, to, to be a lead applicant for one of our calls, you need to uh, be affiliated to a Dutch research performing organization uh, where the Netherlands eScience Center, as Rob mentioned, our funding comes from MDO and SIR. So it makes sense that we actually also primarily fund uh, Dutch researchers. We do very much value international uh, collaborations. So you can add a number of uh, uh, people as co, uh, uh, co applicants to your proposal or to the team that, is, that will work on the proposal um, or the project uh, that actually uh, come from, uh, from the international research community because. Uh, uh, well, the research doesn't stop at the, at the, at the boundaries of, uh, of the Netherlands, of course, and especially to make something sustainable for a large community, chances are that you probably need contributions from, in, uh, from, uh, from worldwide in most cases. So it makes sense uh, to do that. Uh, you need to have a PhD. Uh, um, this specifically doesn't say you need to be a professor of any kind. Uh, it's also on purpose because uh, uh, for this call, uh, we also expect that people are basically uh, creating and maintaining research software uh, uh, may not actually be the professors, uh, but have uh, some alternative uh, uh, employment. Uh, could it be an RSE, for instance? Um, uh, we do require a permanent contract also uh, so that the, the, the long term uh, ness of this uh, of this uh, of the outcome of the project is uh, more or less guaranteed. Um, and uh, importantly, we require a minimal commitment to the project for a half a day per week, because we really value um, uh, the collaboration. So, so if we uh, show up and, uh, and try to help you in making your software more sustainable, then we do also uh, require commitment from your side um, to actually make this a successful partnership. If we, if we just uh, build something for you and then, then, then send it back to you the year after we're done, uh, be it software or tutorial, any of that kind, we we uh, we really find that it really doesn't work. You really need this collaboration uh, and close collaboration. So I think this uh, this half day per week uh, is a uh, uh, pretty fair to ask, and it's already uh, a minimum. And then uh, what can be applied for? I put it in the same uh, uh, table as in uh, the, the other calls. If you happen to be at uh, the meeting uh, last week, the information event for easy comparison. Um, so our requirements, uh, you can see here, uh, we require a software management plan that uh, Carlos will be say something about uh, for the full proposal, uh, where basically this plan uh, is trying to show and trying to, uh, uh, to write down how you actually will make the software more sustainable, because this is of course an important factor of any software, but in particular this goal where the goal is actually to make it more sustainable. Uh, the projects will last uh, up to two years uh, and will be for two person years. Um, this um, basically means it would be a full-time person. Uh, what we usually have at the Eastside Center is that more than one RSE contributes to uh, to a specific project. We have one lead RSE that's your main contact that you on a day-to-day -day basis work with. Uh, but very often we see that uh, that uh, uh, projects require expertise uh, from uh, from engineers uh, that potentially all across the Eastside Center. It's one of the, the the upsides of having such a large team. That we have basically have experts in pretty much all technologies required for research software. Um, there's also, a, um, uh, as I mentioned, that uh, uh, having a large research infrastructure or research consortia actually support your uh, software um, and uh, your proposal is actually highly valued um, because we're really tr not trying to uh, uh, solve the problem of one particular researcher, we're trying to, uh, to solve this of, uh, of large groups of researchers. Um, there's a workshop associated with every uh, um, uh, proposal. We find it really works well to get people to, to be in a room together for, uh, for uh, a few days uh, to actually talk about uh, the topic and why they're using software to fix these, uh, um, the research questions they have and what they want to use it for. So we actually, uh, uh, Pay the expenses of, uh, of a workshop. Um, and also good to know that there will be two projects in this call. Um, so as, a, as we mentioned, this is an experiment. Uh, so we're also starting a bit small. And this is why we're, uh, uh, we have these two 
rather substantial projects um, that together hopefully will uh, will allow us both to make uh, impact and also see if this is a, a route uh, we will be taking in the future. Um, yes, yeah, so something on these workshops. Um, as Rob mentioned, we only do uh, in-kind contributions, so it seems a bit odd that we're funding a workshop. Um, and uh, but basically, we we uh, we we cover the cost, right? So uh, so so uh, you can organize this workshop and then send us the invoice, and uh, uh, we'll pay for the cost. Uh, other than that, it's all up to the good applicant to organize this. Of course, we can help. Um, and uh, this should really help in uh, building the community. So this is a step-by-step -step of our uh, as simple as possible procedure. So, uh, so bear with me. Uh, first step is the information event. So yeah, you made that already, that's nice. Uh, it's completely optional. So uh, there's no need to, uh, to worry if you missed this, if you're watching this on YouTube, um, anybody can join. Um, uh, then we have a proposition. This is actually one of the ways we really try to make this as, uh, as lightweight as possible. Uh, as you know, sometimes the, the success rates of, of, uh, of proposal rounds can be rather low. And then basically everybody that wrote a proposal that didn't get granted kind of wasted their time, at least uh, up to a certain point. So what we try to do is have a proposition where uh, people fill, fill in basically a pretty much single A4 uh, uh, form to say that they would like a project and what the kind of general idea is behind it. And then based on that, we actually already select uh, uh, projects for the second round where actually there's a full proposal that requires uh, some more uh, effort. And in that way, we hope that uh, um, um, a minimal amount of people actually write a full proposal that in the end doesn't get granted. Um, it's only this one single document. There's no other documents, no attachments, no signatures needed. It's uh, basically uh, you write it, you sign it, uh, and you send it. And we use ISAC uh, for the for the submission system. This is the the and the bureau system you're probably familiar with uh, that they use for all their calls. And the bureau supports us in doing this uh, this call, also to make sure it's uh, it's uh, uh, properly executed and fair and, uh, uh, and reviewed independently. Uh, then there's an eligibility check that we do and a software and data health check that I'll be explaining a bit more about. The eligibility check are basically the uh, the rules I just explained about uh, who can be a, uh, a lead applicant uh, and if this uh, matches our expertise. Um, as one uh, example, the eSign Center uh, doesn't do a lot of uh, uh, work in terms of security. So if your project's all about security, then uh, we may not be the, a good match. Uh, for your uh, proposal um, and we do a, a check at the beginning to make sure you don't end up at the full proposal uh, phase and then hear about this uh, this mismatch um, and then we do a pre-selection of a maximum of six uh, propositions uh, so this is done by the eSign center um, uh, where basically we, we we try to find the six uh, most promising uh, proposals um, and then uh, these go to the full proposal round, uh, where actually um, uh, we will actually help you in making a great proposal out of this. So we actually uh, 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 will add a senior uh, a senior member of the eSign Center uh, uh, employees to to every proposal, and they will actually help you meet with you uh, to actually uh, try to make this as great as a proposal as they can. And uh, as you can expect, then these people get pretty biased towards uh, uh, your proposal. So also, um, uh, they're no longer allowed to, uh, to, to review the proposals or any other proposal. And actually, uh, more drastically, the eSign Center doesn't do any reviewing of the, the final round, right? We really believe that uh, by the time um, we, uh, we help you to, to make this proposal in the full round, they should all be great proposals. So then actually, in, uh, um, the selection is done actually by an external committee. Uh, this full proposal includes the software management plan. Um, so although we will actually help you with uh, uh, with uh, creating that, uh, also we thought it's good to explain uh, the software management plan and the ideas behind it. Um, so we can actually, uh, so there's a presentation on that. And there's also support letters, 
uh, there that you can actually add as proof that the community is interested in the software, that other people will actually also maintain it and uh, other ways of showing that there is genuine interest from the community in this software. Um, submission again is by Isaac. Uh, there's an eligibility check, which is exactly the same check as the first one, but uh, you know, uh, stuff may have changed. Um, and then there's a panel assessment, uh, which as I mentioned is run by NWO. Um, a number of domain experts actually uh, check out the, its proposal. So this is your peers. We do this uh, 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 based on, uh, on what domain you actually uh, select when you submit the proposal. Um, and the number of uh, software sustainability experts will also be looking at the proposals to see uh, which one has the best uh, plan. And then in the end, it's awarded by the ESAN Center Board. Uh, we hope this is somewhere in uh, November. Uh, it could be December, depending on uh, the timelines. So this uh, software and data health check, uh, I mentioned there's one of the very early stages in the, in the process. Um, it's basically what we try to do is, uh, is make sure that the, the whatever software is, uh, you, you, you come with actually is suitable to do a project, uh, especially given the type of project you want to do. Um, so if you say, I would really like to organize uh, lots of hackathons in my project, and this is the, the kind of the, the focus of my project. So we'll start in week one with organizing a hackathon. And then actually uh, we, we download the software, try it out, and it turns out that it takes us a day and a half to install. Um, then probably something needs to be fixed on the software before we can do this hackathon. Uh, or uh, licensing may be some kind of uh, uh, commercial license, which means we cannot install it at all and that sort of thing. Uh, so that's why we put this software and data health check there. It's specifically not meant as a way to check if your software is good enough for us. That's not the point. But we really try to, to, to ensure it's at least uh, suitable for the, the type of project we will be doing. And that if there is something that still needs to be fixed, which is always the case for any piece of software, that also the project actually can then uh, allow for this uh, with some time uh, and effort. Um, then the, the, the pre-selection criteria, uh, which is a, a pretty important factor for these uh, uh, proposals. Um, so first is eligibility check. Uh, basically the rules in uh, who can apply uh, and the match with our expertise. Uh, then a software and data health check. Is this actually a good basis for uh, the project you're proposing? Uh, and then uh, the match to uh, the call based on the proposal objectives. So this is basically the, the first page of the call. If you read that, uh, Rob also explained it just now in a slide, uh, but for good measure, I actually uh, quoted here. So I won't read this, uh, uh, but uh, basically, um, a successful project are supposed to do one or more of these objectives, not all of them at the same time. Uh, projects are also not infinite, uh, but it should be do one or it should do one or more of these objectives. And we do check if, uh, if, if what you're proposing actually uh, matches this. Um, then there's a second uh, paragraph. It's basically the what a successful project should be. Um, so this is. Uh, um, basically this um, and again we will check against this of course this is the also the, uh, the 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 showing what the proposal should be in the final round so in the pre-proposal round we will uh, do a light review of this uh, especially the last part on uh, providing a clear strategy for the future maintenance and sustainability well this is kind of the purpose of the entire uh, proposal and this is also something we can help you with in writing a full proposal. So we do not, do not expect lead applicants to be able to come up with a perfect answer for all of these questions, uh, but at least come up with something that uh, seems to be going in the right direction. Right, so uh, last but not least, a timetable. Uh, so we're now at this uh, information event. Uh, there's a deadline for this project proposition. It's on 16th of March, which as you can see is actually quite close to now. Um, as I mentioned, we did make it uh, as easy as possible. So I think given a good idea, you should be able to write uh, this proposition in under two hours easily. Uh, is, um, so, so hopefully that should, uh, should be doable for everybody. Um, then in March, April, we'll have the eligibility check. 
uh, April May will be the, the consultation meetings where we we help you uh, write your proposal. So we'll do a selection. We'll we'll assign you somebody to help you with writing your proposal. Uh, then of the 8th of June, there's a deadline for the full proposal, including the software management plan. Uh, we'll do an eligibility check again. Then there'll be a panel assessment after the summer. And then uh, somewhere in the last quarter of the year, uh, we will inform you of the final decision so that hopefully uh, next year, early next year, we can actually start uh, planning and starting these projects. Right. So that's it for all the practical information. Thank you for all the questions in the chat. We'll also try to answer them in the in the chat and uh, any other questions we can uh, carry over to the question and answer section uh, at the end of the presentations. Uh, now over to Rob again for explaining what kind of technological, technological competences we have and how we can actually uh, help you with, your, uh, uh, with the technical work required. All right, thanks Jos. Yeah, you can immediately go to the next slide, I think. So, yep. Um, so, like we said, th this call is a little bit different from the, the calls we had before. Um, so, I, I would argue that, that any type of software we would probably work on together with you, huh? because we're doing it together, it's going to be research software. And our RCs have a very broad interest in, in software in general, so they can work on, on almost any type of software, I think. And the projects are long enough, huh? they're two years or to person years. And there's also some time to learn. Um, and finally, we're also going to co-write a proposal together with you. Uh, so uh, our engineers or our technology leads, of course, have a perfect uh, overview of uh, what the expertise in your organization is. Uh, so they can, all, they can also help you to make this match, yeah, to make sure that it actually aligns, uh, your proposal aligns with the expertise of the design center. But nevertheless, maybe uh, I should go over this in uh, like, um, with a bird's eye view, um, you basically have five uh, core technological expertises, uh, which are AI, so artificial intelligence, uh, analytics, data processing, computing, and in general, software quality. Um, and that's really a, a cross-cutting cross um, expertise, of course. And that's really our bread and butter, make sure that the software is of high quality. Um, let me go over them one, one by one, uh, but quickly. Um, so we do a lot of AI or application of uh, AI in different uh, types of projects in di different types of uh, disciplines. Uh, sometimes we develop new AI methods, but usually we just apply uh, the state of the art that's out there, but in innovative uh, research questions. Uh, machine learning, of course, is pretty broad. Eh? It can be deep learning, but it can also be uh, decision trees, or it, yeah, it can be many different types of machine learning. Uh, and it can be based on, on images or text or um, time series data or well, many different types of data that you can actually uh, deal with. Um, and you could say that AI very often is a specific kind of analytics. Uh, it can do, of course, more, more than only analytics, but very often it's used in, in analytics. And that's actually one of our expertise areas as well. Uh, so big data analytics. Now, I actually really hate the term big data um, because it's much more about, well, it can be about volume, but that's only one aspect of data, right? It's also about data complexity and uh, how heterogeneous the data is, et cetera, et cetera. So the, the size doesn't really say that much about how complex analytics are. Um, but we do a lot of data analytics uh, at a small scale, but at, uh, also at a big scale. And specifically, we focus a lot on text, but also on visualization and even storytelling. Yeah? So you can do analytics, but how do you go from data to, to insights, to transferring that insight to uh, your target audience? Yeah? How do you tell the story that's in the data? Um, we basically do all aspects of that. And then we do a lot of data processing. Uh, that's, of course, very often needed to do the analytics and specifically also to do AI. You need to, to do a lot of data processing and data preparation very often. Uh, but also in general, we do lots of, of database work or we apply databases in our projects. Uh, we've been doing a lot of real-time data analytics or data analysis, uh, for example, in, in radio astronomy or in other fields where you have data streams and maybe high energy physics, data streams that are really large um, and you have to process them in real time because you cannot store them to disk, for example. So they're simply too big. 
There can also be other reasons, of course, for doing things in real time. Uh, maybe it, it, the problem is just fundamentally uh, has to be addressed in real time. And we basically have a lot of expertise in, in yeah, processing real time data, doing analytics, making sense of, of streaming real time data. Um, a lot of times we're trying to combine several data sets to answer research questions. And the data can be very heterogeneous. So our, uh, data interoperability, data assimilation, uh, linking different types of, of data sets together to answer questions is something that we do a lot. Actually, in all disciplines, so that could be geospatial data, it could also be social sciences data, uh, statistical data from the CBS, for example, the Bureau of uh, Statistics. And it can be all sorts and, and shapes and forms of, of data that you want to uh, combine together to answer. Um, and we basically do that every day in, in all disciplines. And then another expertise area is computing. Uh, that also comes again in many different shapes and forms. So we uh, specifically work very often on accelerators, so things like GPUs, graphics processing units, which you use uh, well, almost for all high performance computing applications nowadays. If you want performance, you better use some form of accelerator, if that matches your application, of course. Not all applications work uh, on accelerators. But... So we do a lot of GPU programming, but also in general high performance computing. So if you need to use a big supercomputer, maybe the, the infrastructure provided by SURF, the national uh, supercomputer, for example, but also uh, other clusters, maybe in your department or also international clusters, but whatever is basically needed to get the performance that you need, we can we can help it. Um, could also be in a cloud, uh, even commercial clouds like Amazon or Azure or you know, any type of uh, commercial cloud provider, but also public clouds. Uh, Surf also is providing uh, public clouds, for example. And one thing in computing we're also very often doing is combining different simulations. So model couplings, basically. Right? If you have, uh, for example, in astrophysics, you might have a simulation that combines uh, the gravity of different stars with stellar evolution. Um, well, then you can basically do this in any, any type of discipline. Right? We are doing lots of model couplings also in climate or water management uh, well, in all disciplines. Um, of particular interest for this call is our software quality expertise, um, which is, like I said, really cross-cutting. Eh? It's really an overarching expertise, you can say. So we develop workflow technologies. Uh, we try to make uh, workflows also fair. Eh? So a workflow should be findable, accessible, interoperable, and usable. Um, that's not only true for data. Eh? It's also true for software. We actually uh, are one of the... Uh, yeah, you could say initiators of the whole fair for research software movement, uh, and you can extend it also to workflows. So in general, we're trying to improve the best practices for software, and we share them as well, um, as, as broadly and as often as we can, basically. So in general, we're trying to advance software sustainability, that's the whole point of this call. And we also try to just increase the academic impact that we have eh, with the software. That's, uh, again, also the purpose of this call, enlarging the impact of the software that we build uh, together. Uh, next slide, Niels. Um, so the uh, presentation will follow about this, uh, given by uh, people from uh, SURF, our, our colleagues. Um, and that's about the, the needs from the infrastructure that you might have. Uh, and the code that you want to make sustainable uh, will run on a certain platform. Uh, might be platform agnostic, I don't know. It really depends on, on the type of software that you have. But if you have any infrastructural needs, in terms of computing power, uh, data storage, uh, data transfers, or uh, visualization could be one. Uh, so any type of infrastructure needs, we can discuss them. And also, we really very closely collaborate with SURF. And they're one of our um, founding members. Uh, so we really work, uh, have a very good long-term relationship with them. And we really like to work the, with SURF infrastructure as well. Um, but we're also at the same time infrastructure agnostic. So if your code has to run on uh, the international praise uh, network of supercomputers, then you can also accommodate that. Or if it's best suited for a commercial cloud provider, we could also work with that. We try to make it as agnostic to the infrastructure as possible. But of course, our first preference is always to work with the national infrastructure that's actually there. So we very often use the facilities uh, offered by SURF. Next one, Niels. Um, so I already mentioned that one of the important aspects of this call is to, to uh, 
And what is the impact? Eh? Make the software sustainable, build communities around the software. And uh, we developed a platform to help us with that. And that's called the Research Software Directory. It's basically um, a showcase of the research software that's uh, available uh, nationally and also internationally. And not only the software developed by the Design Center, but more, it's more a national resource. But certainly all the software that we work on, we try to add this to this uh, research software directory. Uh, and you could say this is sort of an implementation of the FAIR principles for research software. Or at least we want to make it findable and accessible uh, with the goal of making it more reusable for others, right? including in different projects. So it's like a showcase, eh? it's like a shopping window where you can uh, showcase your software. And also if you're looking for software, you can also go here to find uh, research software. The next one, Niels. Um, yeah, so like I said, eh, the, the research software directory is about making software findable. Also making it accessible, so make it really easy to, to download it and to uh, basically very quickly judge if it's relevant for you and if it's usable for you. Um, yeah, again, make it findable. Huh? And at the same time, uh, we also try to sort of estimate, and this is not an exact science, but we try to sort of indicate what the return on investment is. So you may have put a lot of, of effort and energy and time and money in, in the research software that you've developed. And we're going to do that together with you eh, if you have a successful proposal. And one of the things we try to track is the impact of the research software. And we basically build a whole dashboard where you can uh, look at the software and see, okay, it has been cited so many times and there are so many uh, external contributions to the research software and it's used in those projects, et cetera, et cetera. So we try to assess the impact, basically. Um, and I'll give a couple of examples uh, next, I think. Uh, yeah. So we, this is sort of a, uh, yeah, we can go through an, an RSD software page, basically, uh, step by step. So it tries to improve the findability for humans, actually also for machines. So we do search engine optimization, for example, so to, uh, to really make sure that your software um, is easy to find also via search engines, but also for humans. So we basically have a very short description. What's the software for? What problem does it solve? And for its research domain or research domains, uh, could it be used? Uh, next one. Uh, but also, uh, yeah, how was it mentioned? That we basically try to describe, describe the academic and social context of the software. So is it used in, in papers? Uh, is it used in presentations? Were there blog posts about the software? Are there videos, maybe tutorials uh, that talk about the software? In which project, research projects, was it used in the past? And of course, last but certainly not least, uh, who are the people contributing to the software? Uh, and, uh, to give credit where credit is due. But also um, to give you a contact point. Yeah? Who do you call when the software, uh, when you want a new feature or uh, when you found a bug or you need support for software? You just want to see uh, a person behind it. And software is really uh, not only technology, it's also um, something that's built by people. Uh, it, it's a reason to interact with different people. Uh, next one. Um, so we also try to say something about the the liveliness of software, you could say, yeah? the development activity. So is it uh, that software project that was uh, built by a PhD student uh, 10 years ago and then was abandoned? Or is it really alive and actively being maintained and, and thus sustainable? Um, so we basically show uh, the activity over time. That's what you see in this graph. Uh, that's actually created from GitHub. Uh, but we also show you how to get started, eh? to download it with a single click uh, of the button. And also, how do you cite it? Yeah, cite the software as a first-class citizen, not only research papers, but you can actually also cite software itself. Um, and we make that really easy to do. So if you wrote a piece of software, and we are going to do that in this call, of course, we really stimulate users of the software to cite it. So you can actually get credit and you get the benefits of working on this software. You get the recognition yeah, for developing this software. Uh, next one. Oh yeah, that was already the, the end of the research software question. Yeah. Then I think I give the word to Carlos. But Niels, maybe you want to... Uh... Yeah. Uh, as we mentioned, there's a software management plans are, uh, are pretty important to us. Uh, Carlos will explain also how this came to be. Um, but especially for this call, it makes sense uh, that uh, if you don't have a decent plan on how you make your software more sustainable, then why do this project at all, right? That's what the entire call is about. 
so we try to solidify this into a, a document. Uh, and Carlos will explain uh, what this document about and uh, uh, if we need yet another uh, more bureaucratic system or if this is actually going to be really helpful. A spoiler, I think it will be. So take it away, Carlos. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thanks, Niels. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so software management plans, if we go to the next slide, I'll start by uh, talking about how we uh, think about software management plans. So uh, we think about uh, your software as a piece of machinery that is uh, doing some, some work for you, but actually a different way of thinking about your software, if we go to the next one, is to think of it about like it's a plant. Uh, and uh, like any plant, it, it grows over time. And so your software, we go to the next one. Uh, over time, your software evolves and uh, does more things. You start doing for doing it one thing, and then you start saying, oh, maybe it can do more than one thing. And it starts growing and it starts developing. So uh, what, the way that we think about software management plans is that it helps you in a way, uh, if we go to the next one, to provide everything that you need to provide your software with, to, to water your plant properly to uh, on a weekly basis or a monthly basis or however often it needs so that it will, if we go to the next one, so that your software can grow and uh, reach its full potential uh, and uh, be the best version of your software that you can, that, that you can achieve. So this is a little bit of a, a, a nice, uh, way of uh, thinking about software management plans. Uh, if we go to the next one, please. Um, so in reality, what, what we did is together with NWO, we, uh, we drafted this document on, uh, or we wrote this document on practical guides for software management plans. Uh, and basically in these, um, these documents outline some uh, requirements that you need to have uh, for uh, managing your software in the, in the best possible way. Uh, so to help your software grow to its full potential. Um, but of course we start if, with the assumption that there's different types of software, that not all software is created equal and not all software requires the same type of management. Uh, so you will have on the one side, may, maybe your software is just a, a few scripts to analyze some data uh, and it has a very small uh, number of users that will be reusing them. Maybe they will want to look at them and understand how they're uh, used, but maybe you don't, you don't have hundreds of people who rely on, on the, these scripts. So then maybe you need a very low level of management. On the other end of the spectrum, you would have software that is a high, um, a, a high performing infrastructure that lots of researchers rely on on this infrastructure to perform their research every day and then you want to have you want to make sure that this software is running at full capacity as long as uh, highly available as possible so that's a completely different uh, type of management that you need to do you need to, to manage it a lot more carefully and that would be like on a different side of the spectrum and then you have everything in between right so you have from the different types of software will fall somewhere, somewhere in the spectrum between very simple scripts to infrastructure, a very uh, high performance infrastructure. Uh, and then you will need to manage your software in a different way, depending on where, where you are in the spectrum. So um, the, the software management plan requirements are basically some, uh, basically building blocks of, of things that you can, uh, requirements that you can choose which ones are relevant for your software, depending on how much it needs to be managed according to you, because you're the one that knows your software best. So you're the one who knows best how to um, help it realize its full potential. Um, so uh, in, in a little bit to answer Neil's question, is this another bit of uh, a boring admin that we just have to do because it's a requirement from this end center? That's entirely not the, the idea behind this document. That is, that's entirely not the point of a software management plan. It really should be a, a document that, that is a, almost a conservation, a, a conversation starter that you can use this document to, to start thinking about how to best manage your software. Or am, am I already doing everything that I can possibly do to make sure my software is uh, the best it can be? 
Um, and so if we go to the next slide, Niels, uh, thank you. Um, so th th these are some, uh, some of the requirements uh, that are um, in these software management plan guidelines. Uh, so here we have like a, as a lonely island, the purpose of your software, that's, that's where you, you would need to start. And I think every piece of software, you need to clearly state uh, what is the software for, who is the intended audience, who's going to use it, and what can they, what problem does the software solve for them? Uh, so that that's like a, an almost compulsory requirement for, for every type of software everywhere in the spectrum. Uh, and then we have uh, these different uh, engineering uh, documentation and project management uh, type of requirements. Some of them, like version control, user documentation, software licensing, are probably applicable to software across the spectrum. And then there's the, um, there's some requirements that uh, such like uh, packaging or uh, deployment documentation or uh, risk analysis that is probably not relevant to every type of software, but then it, it's up to you to decide if this is something that your software uh, needs. And if we go to the next one, Niels. Uh, okay, so, so the, this is a, a, a screenshot from the software management plan template that we have uh, for this call. So the version 2023 of the eScience Center. Uh, and these are some of the questions that are uh, included in this um, in this uh, document. I think uh, Niels, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, applicants in this call can have some help with the uh, completing this. Uh, yeah. Document. Yeah. So, so software management plan is in the second round of this call, where actually there will be an eSign Center uh, uh, co-author to help you write this. Um, personally, I think that 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 it's it's good for us to to, to think along with this. Um, uh, but as you also can see from the questions, it's very much on where do you want to go with your software. So there's yeah. no right or wrong here. Uh, so 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 also we cannot think of uh, what measures we will take to do the long long term sustainability. Right? Do you want to? Uh, um, uh, you want to boost the community. Do you, do you want to use it in a course? Do you want to uh, hook it up to a commercial entity that wants to do support of this software? Do you, you know, do you want to use user training? Do you want to use it in in teaching? Right? There's a million ways to do this. So, uh, but yes, we will definitely help. Yeah, exactly. So then, uh, uh, I don't want. Then uh, there's no need to go into the, too much detail about these questions, but uh, and how what would be a, a, a how you would go about that to answer them. But it, it's really like Neil said, it's about uh, where you want to go with your software. And the, 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 the whole point of these questions is that you can have a conversation uh, with someone uh, and to have a, a moment in which you can reflect and think, okay, uh, uh, have I thought about this for my software? For example, have I thought about what's the purpose of my software? Who, who do I see it as being the main user of my software and uh, what do they need for and to be able to to use my software, uh, and how how do I want to uh, how do I see my software being used during the project after the project, and how do I see it being sustained in the long term? Uh, in the long term, can I, uh, like Neil said, somehow build it into my teaching or into a course that we give at my department that all my all the students are going to be using this software? Then that that helps to, to ensure that it will continue to exist, right? That there will be more users that are aware of it and that rely on the, on the software and that will, yeah, um, contribute to keeping it alive. Uh, so that, that's what basically uh, a very short in a nutshell, what the software management plan is are about. Uh, and I really hope that you'll find this uh, useful for, uh, for your project and really to, to develop your software to reach its full potential and to be the best version of your software that you can have. Um, yeah, that's it. Thank you, Carlos. We have uh, one final presentation uh, and then we actually have a QA and a session uh, where you can ask any question. Uh, Dan de Jong from uh, SURF will actually explain the, uh, the national research infrastructure and how SURF supports research. Thank you, Dan. 
Thanks, uh, Niels. Uh, can you hear me all right, by the way? Yes. That's great. Thanks for the introduction and uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, so over the next 15 minutes, I'd briefly uh, like to introduce SURF to you and uh, how we at SURF uh, try to support and help uh, researchers and, and research communities uh, across the Netherlands. Um, before I start, I only have about 15 minutes and quite a, a bit of ground to cover. Um, but this presentation will be made available afterwards. And I want to point you to the fact that there's lots of links in the presentation. Uh, and if you uh, click on those links, you'll find additional information on some of the topics uh, that we uh, that I will cover and discuss today and some of the services uh, that we'll cover. Uh, so please, uh, if you have any questions afterwards, feel free to ask, uh, feel free to reach out, but also use the presentation as, uh, as a way to getting to uh, more detailed information. Uh, let me start off by giving a very brief introduction of SURF. Uh, we are a collaborative uh, organization uh, that tries to uh, support the, uh, uh, the education and research community in the Netherlands. Uh, we are owned by our members, so we're uh, a cooperative. And as you can see on the slide, uh, uh, all of the Dutch universities are a member, uh, the university medical centers, uh, quite a lot of higher education and vocational education institutes, and also some independent uh, research uh, institutes. And uh, these members and the, the people that work for these organizations uh, are basically given access to, uh, to the, uh, the services that I'll, uh, that I'll cover. Um, at SURF, we do a number of different things. We have uh, services. So we make those services available uh, to our members, uh, such as uh, uh, high-end compute services, uh, services around processes in analyzing um, and visualizing uh, data. We've got data storage and data management services. Uh, we do activities around trust and identity, and we provide connectivity infrastructure. Um, but we also have a number of activities that we do together with our members. So for example, together with our members, we do procurement. Uh, we jointly go out on the market and buy hardware or software or content. We also do uh, quite a bit of experimentation together with our members. So we have our innovation labs around uh, promising new technologies, and we do um, or facilitate, I should say, knowledge sharing. So we organize events, we organize training sessions, and we organize uh, workshops uh, for our members. Uh, let me just briefly walk you through the, the services that we provide. Um, a category of services that we uh, we provide for our members is around compute. So essentially, if you um, encounter limitations with your own systems, uh, whether that's your own PC or your local infrastructure, then you can turn to us uh, for help. We have a number of different facilities available. Most well known is our national supercomputer, Snellius, which provides researchers with a, a sort of a scale out and scale up uh, option uh, for high performance computing. But we also have Lisa, which is essentially uh, uh, Snellius sister, which provides the same computing capacity or not exactly the same compu computing capacity, but a similar computing capacity, uh, but in a more easy to use environment with lots of uh, pre-installed and pre-configured uh, software. We also have Surf Research Cloud, which is a flexible computing infrastructure. Uh, and we have a number of services around high performance data processing. So essentially, if you have large structured data sets that need to be processed, usually over longer periods of time, then we can also support you with that. And we provide uh, support to a number of uh, applications such as uh, Jupyter Notebooks. Next to these standardized services that you as a researcher can, can turn to a leverage, we also have a number of specialist teams that serve that can provide custom advice and support. So for example, we've got a team that's uh, specialized in, uh, in uh, setting up and, and leveraging cloud-based microservices, for example, on public clouds, such as AWS and, or Azure, uh, and they can help you with very specific questions on those uh, platforms. We've got a visualization service that can help you create high-end visualizations, but also do remote rendering if that's uh, necessary. And we also have an AI and machine learning team that has uh, AI and machine learning expertise that they make available for the research and the education uh, community. Um, we also provide access to um, IT infrastructure in the cloud. 
Uh, and when we say cloud, we actually have two uh, understandings of that. One is Surf Research Cloud, which is our own proprietary cloud that we make available to members and that essentially has computing capabilities, storage capabilities, as well as research data management capabilities. Uh, and this is a facility that's available to members and that's partly funded by the NWO. But we also provide access to some of the public clouds out there. So Azure, AWS, and Google. Uh, we make access to those uh, platforms available through Surf Cumulus, and you can get access to Surf Cumulus uh, when you uh, reach out to your uh, central IT department, or usually when you reach out to uh, the central IT department. In general, if you uh, you want access to our research uh, services or our compute services, there's a number of different ways of getting access. Um, two of those routes run via the NWO and are NWO funded. Uh, the first are pilot grants. So these are basically short-term uh, grants that provide you with uh, limited amounts of compute uh, or storage capacity or support um, at SURF. Um, so this is ideal, for example, if you've got a particular setup that you want to trial, that you want to try out. Um, the pilot grant uh, application process is relatively straightforward and you can uh, quite quickly in a matter of weeks uh, start using uh, uh, those facilities. For the slightly larger um, infrastructure needs, we've got regular grants for uh, larger scale research projects, and uh, those are also uh, available uh, uh, for application through the uh, NWO. Next to that, we've also got uh, uh, two other ways of uh, getting access to our services. Uh, many of our member organizations, so also the uh, uh, very likely the institutes that you are affiliated with, offer direct access uh, to our services or buy access to our services directly. Uh, and that means that if you turn to uh, uh, your IT department or your research support department, that they might be able to uh, point you to, uh, uh, to access as well. And finally, uh, SURF also has a number of uh, standalone open calls that you can turn to uh, for help. For example, uh, when you need uh, support of that team that I mentioned has expertise on uh, public clouds. So that's a, a slight overview of uh, the access routes, which you can in turn also use to get access to our data storage and management capabilities. Now, uh, for the purpose of time, I'm not gonna run you through each single surface uh, that, that we have at SURF uh, to help you with data storage and management. Um, if you're wondering which solution or which surface best fit your needs, then feel free to reach out uh, uh, to us at SURF and we'll be happy to, uh, to point you in the right direction. But I'm just gonna uh, highlight a couple of them. Um, for example, our data archive, uh, which is a, essentially a very large tape archive that helps you uh, store large amounts of data for a very long term. Um, so if uh, uh, cloud hosting, for example, is too expensive, or you don't think that you'll, you'll touch the data for uh, uh, a longer period of time, but you still want to keep it uh, stored in a secure place, then Data Archive is, uh, is a good way to do that. We also uh, offer uh, cloud-based storage, and Research Drive is an example of that. And Research Drive is particularly handy when you're sharing large quantities of data with other researchers and you want to collaboratively work on that data then the Research Drive is, uh, is a good environment for that. And finally, a third service that I briefly want to highlight is um, the work we do around IROTS, uh, which will help you um, essentially manage your data in a compliant and effective uh, manner. Um, essentially at SURF, what we try to do is we try to uh, support the entire research data lifecycle. So um, starting with planning and acquiring your data, uh, all the way to preserving your data and reusing your data. And for each of the steps within this uh, life cycle, we've essentially got a surface available uh, to help you as a researcher or as a research group. Next to our compute and, and research surfaces, we also have a number of other uh, surfaces that we make available to our members. Um, a couple of them are around trust and identity. Uh, so you might know Surf Connect, you might know Edu ID. Um, those are, of course, uh, platforms and tools to provide uh, single sign-on uh, access. Uh, but we also have a service called Surf Research Access Management, uh, which essentially allows research groups to uh, manage their access and entitlement 
uh, when they need to go beyond the walls of a single institution or even a single country. We also do quite a bit of work uh, at serve around uh, connectivity. Um, so uh, we provide the internet connections at many of the institutions uh, uh, that are members, uh, but we also uh, build and, and support point-to-point -point connections uh, from one institution to another or uh, from one private network to another. As I mentioned uh, at the beginning of, uh, of my presentation, uh, we also do a uh, quite a bit of work together with our members around uh, joint procurement or collective procurement. Uh, and essentially what we try to do is we try to purchase IT and content from commercial providers on the best possible terms. And we then subsequently also try to make sure that um, you as a researcher can, can use uh, those commercial uh, providers or commercial services. Uh, so we have agreements with Azure and AWS. Uh, and if you'd like to, to, to gain access to Azure or AWS under those agreements, you can uh, do that through our SURF Cumulus platform. Um, we also do a lot of experimentation together with our members, uh, essentially focusing on uh, what we call promising technologies or promising applications uh, that, that we feel or our members feel uh, might uh, 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 yeah, have a positive impact on, on the education and research uh, in the near future. And we try to sort of figure out, well, what is it? What does this mean? And how can we leverage this in the future? And currently we're doing quite a bit of work, for example, around uh, machine learning enhanced uh, HPC. We're doing quite a bit, of, a bit of work around deep learning, but also for example, around uh, quantum computing. And uh, we're giving now some of our members uh, access to some of the experimental quantum computing facilities at the public cloud providers as part of these uh, uh, open innovation uh, labs. Last but not least, um, as I mentioned in the beginning, we also do quite a bit of knowledge sharing uh, or we facilitate quite a bit of knowledge sharing uh, through events, uh, through trainings and through workshops. And for example, if you're as a researcher, uh, you want to um, um, increase your knowledge or increase your experience with um, uh, high performance computing or with RDM principles, then uh, you can uh, join uh, uh, the training sessions that we regularly organize on those topics. And if you go to our agenda, and again, the link is in the, uh, uh, the slide deck, then uh, you'll also find uh, the dates and the uh, option to uh, sign up. So this was my uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, once again, if you uh, if you have any questions, feel free to ask them now or to contact me uh, directly over email. Or if you uh, download the presentation afterwards, then use any of the links to to go to uh, more detailed information on the uh, the services and the other topics that uh, that I covered. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dan. Um, so, all the, in the interest of uh, the Q and A session, I'll be now turning off the recording. So, everybody that joined uh, via YouTube. Uh, Thank you for watching.